course, we are continuing the series we've been studying for a couple of weeks now called The Fourth Dimension. And we've been talking about the fact that there's a lot of crazy things going on, right? There's been a lot going on in 2020. And if you take a step back, you can surely ask yourself, why is all this happening? What is really going on? And so we've been looking at what the Bible says about that because the Bible has answers to any question that we could ask. And the Bible happens to say some things about what we're experiencing in 2020. And in fact, we've also actually gone a step farther and said that maybe you're looking at a situation in your life that has you asking the question, what is going on? And the Bible has answers for you too. There are certain things that God wants to say to you today to help you to see exactly what is behind what you're dealing with and what adjustments you need to make so you can really experience the life that you want to live. You can have the future that God has for you. And so we've learned that we need to do a couple of things. Number one, to open our eyes, particularly to the fact that there is another dimension. We're calling it the fourth dimension in this series, but the Bible often calls it the spirit realm. We learned that we are warriors in that dimension. We're at a war against an enemy who's trying to harm us and trying to keep us from helping God save as many people as possible. And then last week, we learned to not be fooled. We learned that Satan is after you. You are a high value target. We learned the tools that he uses to get you to turn away from God, to turn you into a Judas. And we learned about the things we need to do so that we don't fall for that trick. Today, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. This is, of course, the opening of scripture that talks about putting on the armor of God. And in verse 11, it says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. So put on all of God's armor. Why should I put on God's armor? So that you'll be able to stand. That's the goal here, that you can hold up when you come under attack. You don't fall and when you're attacked instead, so you can stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Now, the New Testament is translated from the Greek, and the word strategies or even wiles, as it said in the King James Version, it means trickery. And one of the ways that is translated is ambush. So the Bible is telling us here that ambushes are coming, that Satan is going to attack you. And you need to be prepared to deal with those attacks. And that begs the question, what does his attack look like, right? How does he attack us? We went to that a little bit last week, but let's go a step farther. What is he really after? What's his goal in attacking you? Well, in Mark chapter 4, the Bible says this. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble, or the King James Version says, they are offended. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things, get this, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Entering in where? Well, this started off in Mark chapter 4 saying that Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Then at the end of this, we read, that Satan uses the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire of other things and causes them to enter in where? The heart. Proverbs chapter four and verse 23 says this, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. So we asked the question, what is Satan really after in attacking you? Whether he sends people your way uh, to attack you, whether some negative circumstances happen, whether he sends thoughts your way, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. The answer is he's after your heart. The, real, the first battlefield that you fight your battles on as a warrior for God, if you happen to be somebody that's following Jesus, is the battlefield of the heart, which is the real you, you're a spirit, so the spirit, and then of the mind. 
But before we get into thinking about the mind, let's focus on the fact that ultimately the goal is to get to the heart. When I was a kid, I used to love to play laser tag. And, you know, when you would play laser tag, even now, if you go places and you play laser tag, sometimes what you'll find is the goal is to get to the heart of the enemy's side, right? You're trying to take out whatever is there at the heart of it, right in the middle, their base. And if you can do that enough, you can win. I grew up loving Star Wars, and the very first Star Wars, A New Hope, was won because they got to the very heart of the Death Star. When they fired that torpedo into the heart of the Death Star, then this huge thing that they could not defeat from the outside, and, uh, it, it exploded, and they were able to win. Well, Satan knows that if you're a follower of Jesus, he can't defeat you from the outside. That it doesn't matter what trouble he sends your way, what people he sends your way, he can't stop you. So the only way he can stop you from doing great things for God and people, the only way he can stop you from experiencing the future that God has for you personally is to win from within, is to attack your heart. And so he really uh, sends a lot of attacks that way with that goal in mind. And in fact, we just read in Mark chapter four how the word of God is sent and Satan comes and scoops it up out of people's hearts. So basically what he does is that he he tricks people into being hard-hearted, right? Instead of receiving what God sent, they say, I, I don't receive that. And so then they lose it from their hearts. The second one we read was, of course, him sending tribulation or persecution. Of course, tribulation is trouble that comes your way. Some of us are in the middle of that right now. Persecution is when people come against you because of what you believe. A lot of us are dealing with that right now. But notice that the scripture doesn't say tribulation or persecution is what defeats you. What defeats the word in your life is that you become offended. In other words, he sends trouble your way so in your heart you get mad at God. And then we already talked about how he'll send temptation. He'll try to get you to get caught up in the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust or desires of other things. He tries to get those things in your heart. Why? So you'll defeat yourself. You notice that the Bible never says Satan is all powerful. It doesn't call him omnipotent, but it does call him the great deceiver. And that's what he tries to do. He tries to deceive you into defeating yourself. Someone once said about sin, that sin is basically self-inflicted nonsense. In other words, you are sinning against God and in doing so, harming yourself. That's Satan's goal. He's after your heart. And so last week we dealt with the war that we are, where we are overcoming attacks that the enemy sends our way from the outside. We dealt with that side of things. This week, I want us to learn how to overcome the attacks that Satan sends on the inside, that he sends from the inside. I want you to win from within. Why don't you put that in your comments right there? Win from within. Because you're going to have to win from within to win the war that's in your life and to help God win the war that's going on in our cities, our country, and in our world. So let's dive, like, let's dive into this, excuse me, and, and Romans chapter 7. And I really want you to see that Satan already has gotten a leg up on, uh, on many of us. It's already kind of gotten a leg up in this battle because he's implanted kind of a virus in us, a kind of damaged cold in us. So Romans chapter seven, it helps us see this in verse 14. It says, so the trouble is not with the law for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself for I want to do what is right but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But I know that what I am doing is wrong. This shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. The King James Version says in my flesh. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? What's he saying? Man, I want to do the right thing and I find myself doing the wrong thing. And then when I tell myself don't do the wrong thing, then, you know, guess what? I do it anyway. 
I was golfing with my father the other day. I've decided to try to learn, right, to pick it up and, and get serious about it. And I don't know what it is about when you're looking at that ball and you're telling yourself, don't slice it right. Don't slice it right. That then when you swing, guess what you do? Slice it right. <laughs> it just seems to be how things are. And he's telling us here about the condition that those of us who even love God find ourselves in. That when we want to do right, we find ourselves doing wrong. When we tell ourselves not to do wrong, we still do wrong. And he's explaining why this is. In fact, he said something already. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature or in my flesh. Well, that's interesting. If you, keep, if you jump down a little bit, he says, but if I do what I don't want to do, I am not the one, really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me. That's the second time that does it. He goes on to say, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me, there it is again, that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. That's the third or fourth time. In fact, if you were to look at this in the King James Version, you'll find that he says sin is in our flesh or in our body five times. So he's telling us something here. He's telling us that your flesh, and another term for that we might use today is human nature, right? Your, your, your nature is infected with sin. You may say, well, wait a minute. I, I made a decision to follow Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Right. But that's talking about your spirit. Your spirit became brand new, but your body didn't change. You didn't suddenly put on six inches or lose 40 pounds the minute you made Jesus the Lord of your life. And the same thing is true about your sin, about your flesh or human nature. And that is that there is sin in your flesh. Basically, the Bible is telling us once again that your body has been infected with sin. That is like you got bad cold in you and it's trying to spread to your heart. Even though God has caused you to be brand new and he's caused you know, your heart to be pure, that, that sin nature is still working to get you to, to, to turn away from God and, and your heart to go back to being what it was, separated from him. You know, I, as I was reading this and thinking about this, I thought about, you know, I love science fiction. And so, you know, there are movies where I've seen things similar to this, where maybe somebody has a virus in their body. They can see it trying to spread and they got to take some kind of medicine. Or they got to do something to keep keep pushing it off, to keep fending it off so it can never reach its goal of reaching their heart and killing them. And that's a good picture of what we're dealing with right now in our bodies today. We have a sin nature and that sin nature, our flesh always wants to do what's wrong while our spirit always wants to do what's right. In fact, in Galatians chapter five and verse 16, it says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And I think the idea here is without difficulty. In other words, I love how the, new, uh, the one translation, the TCNT says, to perform what is right is not easy. And we already know this. Those of us who are following God, we know that there is something going on in me. There's a war going on within me. I've got a desire to do what's right, but there's always this desire to do what is wrong. And it's a battle that you fight every day and you will fight every day until Jesus comes back. Now, when he comes back and there is a rapture, the Bible teaches we get a new body. Not that we leave this body, but their new body clothes uh, this new body, this old body, and it swallows up that sin nature. And you don't have that problem. You won't have that problem anymore. But right now, we're stuck with this. We're stuck with the fact that there's a virus in us. There's an infection in us, in our flesh, that is constantly trying to get us to do the wrong thing, that's constantly trying to push us away from God. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that whether or not you consistently win in the war for your life 
and you're helping God win the war for this world it is really determined by if you consistently win the war within. If you're somebody that does what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, he says, but I keep under my body. I keep my body, my flesh under. I keep it under my feet. I bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. In other words, my flesh is always trying to rise up. So I, I put it under me. I put it under uh, the real me. Because you'll notice here that he's talking about I, 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 I have this in my flesh. The real you is a spirit being. And so he's saying here that I, my spirit being, I do what it takes to keep my flesh under. I do what it takes so that I'm not living my life based on what I feel like doing. I'm living my life based on what God said I should be doing. So notice that that is really the key. That is the key to living the future God has for you. That is the key to winning the war within and then therefore helping God win the war without, right? Well, the battlefield for that battle is really your mind. In Romans chapter eight, in verse six, it says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. The Amplified Bible says in this way, death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. Of course, when you think about sin, it seems to be fun most of the time, but you always pay a price. And it's often more than you expect it to pay. And so we know that sin brings suffering, but not just suffering, but ultimately sin causes you to be separated from God and spend eternity in hell. So he's saying here that if you let your sinful nature your flesh control your mind, then you're going to find it's going to lead to death. And yet, he says, letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. If you allow your spirit to control your mind, that leads to peace, prosperity. That leads to life. That leads to the future God has for you. So let's, let's revisit then what we have going on. You've got your flesh, which is fighting you, trying to get you to sin. You got your spirit, which is fighting your flesh, trying to get you to live right before God. And this is a battle you're facing every day. It's kind of like those old cartoons where you had, you know, a bad Donald Duck on one side and a good Donald Duck on the other. You remember seeing that? How, you know, the bad Donald Duck looked like the devil, had a, was red and had a pitchfork, and the good Donald Duck looked like an angel. And so whenever he was facing a decision, the bad Donald Duck would try to get him to do the wrong thing. The good one would try to, do, try to get him to do the right thing. And he usually chose the wrong thing. Well, in the sense, we're in the same place where your flesh is saying, slap them, right? And your spirit is saying, walk in love, bless them. And your flesh is saying, go ahead and call her at two in the morning. Your spirit is saying, no, don't do that at all. You live right before God. Whatever decision that you're facing, your flesh is always trying to get you to do what's wrong. And your spirit's always trying to get you to do what's right. So what determines which direction to actually go? Your mind. Your mind. And so what the word of God is telling us here is that we need to be very careful of our thoughts. In fact, Ephesians 4 illustrates this even more. It says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So he's talking about your former conduct, the way you acted before you followed Jesus. It's that life of sin. He says, I want you to put off that life of sin. Stop doing the things you used to do. Some might say, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. How do I do that? Here's the answer. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So he's telling me here, stop living the way you used to live, live the way God wants you to live. But how do I get from where I used to live to the way God wants me to live? You got to be renewed in your mind. Romans chapter 12 is another opening of scripture that says the same thing. It says that we ought to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. Instead of letting Satan use them, let's let God use them. It tells us then, how to do that? Be transformed by the renewing of your, your mind. So it all comes down to your thinking. And when it's all said and done, 
Stinking thinking is the problem that so many of us are dealing with right now. Stinking thinking is what's keeping us from the future God has for us. Go ahead and put that in the comments or you want to put, you know, that, that stinky emoji, right? The one that's throwing up in the comments, go for it. That thinking is what is actually causing us to continue to sin, continue to have the same bad habits we couldn't kick. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop looking at porn. I can't stop, you know, you know, cussing folk out. I can't seem to stop drinking. It's because of your thinking. That thinking and changing your thinking is what caused you to be, to live an entirely different way. And many of us who are following God, we've gotten delivered from those things I just finished talking about. We don't live like that anymore. We don't talk like that anymore. We don't have those results in our lives anymore. And the reason why is because we changed our thinking. And so the key here, and, and this is what Satan understands. I may be getting ahead of myself, but he understands that if he can get you to think the wrong way, whatever is in your mind will get in your heart. And we started off by saying he's after your heart. And we said the battlefield is really the battlefield of the heart and the mind, right? This, now we're talking about the mind part. He gets that if he can get you to think on the wrong thing long enough, then that bad cold, that virus will get down into your heart and whatever is in your heart will be in your life. We read it earlier, guard your heart for it determines the course of your life. And so we have to really pay attention to how we think. Satan knows that if he can get you thinking the wrong way, he's going to get you going the wrong way. And that's why he's constantly attacking you in your mind. That's why your thoughts attack. So let's look at Luke chapter four. Let's see an example of this. In verse three, We'll see how the devil does this because we'll know how to combat it, how to fight against it. Somebody put in the comments again, win from within, right? Because you got to win from within. And a way to win from within really is to change how you think. Luke chapter four, let's see how Satan does this. It says, and the devil said to him, talking about Jesus, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. So notice that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He was hungry. The Bible said he was hungry. Of course he'd be hungry. Some of us can't go 40 minutes without being hungry, myself included. So he's hungry. And so Satan chooses to try to tempt him. So he says, I want you to command this stone. If you're the son of God, prove who you are. Command this stone to be turned into bread. Let me throw a little side thought in here for those who like a little meteor things. Satan tried to use the same three tools against Jesus that he did against Eve. And that he tries to do against us, the lust of the flesh, what the body wants, the lust of the eyes, what the eyes see and want, and the pride of life, that, that desire to, be, to, to brag, that desire to be better than others and prove I'm better than others. And so here is the lust of the flesh. Your body is hungry. So if you're the son of God, why don't you just turn the stone into bread? And here's the thing. Words carry and they cause thoughts right? So when Satan said this, he's trying to plant a thought. In fact, think about it. When I say pink elephant, what do you think about? A pink elephant, right? So Satan gets that. So he's literally speaking these words to Jesus. We don't know if he's just doing it in his mind or if he's speaking it out literally. He can hear it audibly. But the bottom line is he's trying to plant these thoughts in his mind of him turning the stone into bread, him eating some bread when he hasn't eaten for 40 days. Then in verse 5, after Jesus rejects that, we'll talk about how in a minute. It says, then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory. But this has been delivered to me and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Notice that Satan has supernatural power. He took Jesus and put him on a high mountain. He gave him a very quick tour of all the kingdoms of the world. Did it in a moment of time. Like, you know, we might watch a video that does that. But even a video doesn't do it that fast. So he has some power. It's just far less than the power that God has or the power he's given us. And once again, he's trying to plan a thought. Hey, if you'll just worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms and 
I'll give you the honor that comes from ruling over them. Of course, Jesus rejects it. So one more time in verse nine, it says, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, jump, right? Throw yourself down from here. For it is written, and notice that, that Satan will uh, at times misinterpret scripture to get to your mind and your heart. And that's one reason why you gotta be very careful uh, who you listen to and what who you read behind, because sometimes very well-intentioned individuals can misinterpret scripture and it can change your view of God and it can cause some things to be in your heart that are not supposed to be there and it can cause a negative result in your life. That's one reason why I talk often about the error that's rampant in the body of Christ, that God sends trouble your way to teach you something. When the Bible just doesn't reveal that, you never see Jesus in the, in the Gospels walking around putting trouble on people so they could learn something. You never see him not heal somebody and say, well, that's on them so they can learn something. And when they get done learning that, then God will heal them. It's just not biblical. But so many people believe that. We preach things out of that. We, we, we write posts about it, how this trouble is something that God is using to help me and his error. And what it does, it causes you to be offended at God and it keeps you from the future that God has for you. Satan will misinterpret scripture to accomplish his goal of getting to your heart through your mind. And so that's what he does here. He says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Once again, he is throwing a thought at Jesus. His goal is to attack your mind with negative thoughts with the goal of you catching those thoughts and continuing to think on them, almost chewing on them, right? He, he wants you to think about it, think about it again, and think about it again, and think about it again until it drops down into your heart. And of course, Acts chapter five in verse three shows us an example of what happens when it drops into your heart. The Bible talks about Ananias and Sapphira. They found themselves in the middle of a move of God. People were selling what they had. They were giving it to the church to take care of the needs of those who had lack. But Ananias and Sapphira decided to lie, to only give some of what they received as a result of selling their possessions. And let's be frank, they didn't have to give it all. They didn't have to lie. So where did this idea of lying to God ultimately come from? Well, in verse Three, it says, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Two things he said. Why has Satan filled your heart? Notice he didn't say, look out, Satan has filled your heart. He says, why did you let this happen? Why, the second thing, have you conceived this thing in your heart? Sounds like seed was planted and you allowed it to come down into your heart and blossom into this action. Well, notice he's talking to someone that's a follower of Jesus and he's letting him know that Satan did this because you let him. You took those thoughts that he planted into your mind and you thought about it and you thought about it and you thought about it and to the place where finally it became something that was in your heart and you acted on it. This is why Jesus said something. He said, why take ye thought? And I think that's an important way of looking at it because that's what you do when it comes to thoughts. You take them or you reject them. And so here Ananias took those thoughts. Kind of like if a FedEx package showed up at my door and I signed for that package. Well, now I'm taking it. Well, Satan is bringing packages your way all the time. He's trying to tell you, you're not smart enough. You're not good looking enough. You should do this. You should do that. They meant this evil thing. They meant that evil thing. All church people are evil. All politicians are evil. I mean, there's so many things that Satan is trying to say to us, trying to get us to accept those thoughts so they can get down into our heart. And now we are doing things that we don't want to do, things that are kind contrary to what we believe. So notice his methodology. The way Satan gets us to turn away from living right, the way he gets us to turn away from God is by planting 
thoughts, whatever the sin is in your life, whatever the bad habit is in your life, whatever the negative the things that are in your life right now, I want you to know it starts with a thought. Put that in the comments. It starts with a thought. Because uh, smoking starts with a thought. Watching porn starts with a thought. Skipping church starts with a thought. Holding back the tide starts with a thought. Whatever it is, it starts with a thought. So what do I do when those thoughts come? You do what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 4, we'll pick back up. We know that Satan asked Jesus or he actually challenged him to turn a stone into bread. And verse 4 tells us Jesus' answer. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written. Notice that he spoke directly to Satan, just like he spoke to the wind, just like he spoke to the waves, just like he spoke to fig trees, just like he told us if we speak to the mountain in faith, it'll move. He spoke directly to him. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And sometimes that means you got to open your mouth and let him know, you know exactly what he's doing and let him know where he needs to go, right? So Jesus says, it is written. In other words, his answer is to give God's word, to speak the word of God. See, you fight thoughts with words. If I were to tell you right now to count to 10 in your head, and in the middle of that count said to say your name, you would lose that count. And the same thing, and so because why? Because you can't think one thing and say another. And the same thing is true when it comes to Satan sending thoughts your way. When he sends those thoughts your way, open your mouth and say what God says about it. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And really, I think what he was getting at here is that living by the word of God for him was only doing what God told him to do. And God didn't tell him to turn that stone into bread, no matter how much he wanted to do so. Well, in verse eight, we know that Satan attempted once again tries to get Jesus to bow down to him so that he could, you know, he says, if you do that, I'll give you authority over all the kingdoms of the world. And in verse eight, Jesus answered and said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. So here he's rebuking him. And Jesus would do that from time to time, outright rebuke demons, rebuke Satan, get behind me. And then he tells them once again what the word of God says. And then we just finished reading about how Satan tried to get Jesus to throw himself off of the temple. Jesus answered in verse 12 and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So what we're seeing here is that Jesus was a high value target for Satan, right? Satan realized that this guy was something special. God just finished saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Satan immediately says, well, if you are the son of God, and he'll do that. He'll question what God told you, right? If God really said that, wouldn't this be the case? In fact, isn't that what happened in Genesis chapter three? God told Adam and Eve, don't partake of this particular fruit. Don't eat this fruit from this tree. And what does the serpent come in and say? Hath God said, is that really so? And some of you, that may be what Satan has been doing in your life right now, trying to get you to doubt what God said. So that's what he's doing with Jesus. Well, if you are the son of God, then why don't you prove it? And so we see that that's what he does. He's, he's trying to plant these thoughts, but Jesus rejects them. Every time a thought comes, he slaps that thing away. How? By opening his mouth and saying what God said. First Peter chapter one and verse 13 reveals to us that this is really what God expects us to do, period, as believers. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. I like those terms right there. Gird up the loins of your mind, even though we don't use that terminology today. The word loins means procreate a power. In other words, the part of you that can create, you need to go ahead and protect yourself. And your mind creates, right? It creates your reality, ultimately. Whatever you think on gets in your heart and gets into your, into your life. And so you need to put on your big boy pants. You need to make a decision to gird up the loins of your mind, which simply means that you need to start living a disciplined mental life. You need to stop letting yourself think 
any old thoughts, bad thoughts, things that are contrary to God's word. Think about and meditate on sin that you want to commit. You got to be careful to, to get your mind, uh, to make sure that your mind is, is your, your thoughts are lining up with God's word. The psalmist said, let the meditation of my heart, what I'm thinking on, be acceptable in your sight. The Bible says in 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, it talks about us having pure minds. Philippians chapter 4 says, whatever is just and pure and honest and of good report, think on these things. And I love what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says. It talks about casting down vain imaginations. And, when, and those of that imaginations happen to come from people preaching a false doctrine. But the principle is still the same. He says, bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ. Bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. In other words, it's time to put on your big boy pants. Time to put on your big girl pants, some might say. It's time to make sure that you are disciplined in your thought life. I like what a friend of mine, uh, Kate McVeigh, says. You need a spiritual customs agent at the door of your mind. What does a customs agent do? They determine whether or not you belong here. And when thoughts come your way that are not right, they're not good, then you know they don't belong here. Now you need to open your mouth and reject those thoughts and say what God says. And when you do that, you're pulling out the sword of the spirit and you're actually counterattacking the enemy. Maybe we'll get into that next week. But the point is, is that you got to make a point of watching your thoughts, of policing your thought life. Because your thoughts matter. And they do. They make a difference. And Satan knows this. And God knows this. And it's time you know this. Because if you'll just get a hold of your thought life, it'll change everything. Well, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Let me, let me say this. Uh, I happened to see a movie preview the other day. I think it was on Netflix. And it was about this guy who's picked up by an Uber driver. And, you know, when, when he gets into the car, you know, she says, hey, I'm so-and-so, you're an Uber driver. And he says, hey, I'm so-and-so. And then as they're getting, they start to talk, she says, you know, something about the mansion that he lives in. And he's saying, actually, that's not my mansion. I've never been there before until today. Well, and she's kind of like, what are you doing there? Well, this woman came to the door and I killed her. And he says to her, you just picked up a serial killer. And the rest of the movie is about her trying to run away from this serial killer, right? Well, man, I mean, first of all, that'll make you never want to be an Uber driver ever, right? But beyond that, would you allow a serial killer in your car? No. So why would you allow a serial killer in your mind? Why would you give Satan real estate up here and, and just keep thinking thoughts that you know came from him? Why would you accept what you know is a virus that's being planted to destroy your, your mind, to corrupt your heart, and ultimately to separate you from God, to destroy your life. You shouldn't. When those thoughts come, recognize them and reject them every time. And you might start off finding yourself having to do that a hundred times on the first day because you've developed the habit of thinking the wrong things. Satan has now developed a stronghold, a castle in your mind, a pattern of thinking that's created the result you're looking at right now. Well, guess what you need to do? Go ahead and put on the armor, right? Go ahead and, and fight and fight off those thoughts. And what you'll find is it'll become easier and easier to have victory in whatever that area is. Ephesians chapter four and verse 27 says this, don't provide an opportunity for the devil. One translation says, don't give him an opportunity to work. Don't give him any opportunity. Don't give him any space in your mind. Don't allow anything that you know doesn't come from God to live up here. Because every time you do, you're hurting, you're hurting yourself. You're putting yourself in a position where you can your, your life can turn the wrong direction. And, you, and Satan is able to win the war within, which means he's able to win the war without. He's able to have a negative impact on your life. And he's able to keep you from really helping God to save this world. So don't give them opportunity. Now, having said that, there's another way that we do that. And that is through what we allow 
to come in front of our eyes and our ears and, and what we allow ourselves to be exposed to. And so I want to give you seven keys to winning from within that's going to help you to not give Satan the opportunity to plant thoughts and to ultimately uh, get things into your heart and into your life. The first thing is you need to watch what you think. We just talked about that. Right. Think on things that are pure and just and honest and of good report. Things that God would be proud of. If we were to take your thoughts and put them online right now and everybody could see what you think about in a 24 hour time period. Let what we see be something that is good and not something that's embarrassing. The second thing, watch what you watch. Because what goes in front of your eyes, whether you're watching on television, you're watching it on social media, watching a movie. It impacts you, man. It plants thoughts into your mind. It impacts your heart. That's why the psalmist said in the 101st Psalm, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. The question you have to ask yourself when you're watching some things is, is this the wicked thing? Is this going to have a negative impact here or here? The next thing is watch what you listen to. Because music has a way, frankly, of bypassing the mind and going straight to the heart. I mean, man, music is so powerful. The Bible talks about stopping your ears of hearing of bloods. In other words, you need to be careful what's coming in your ear gate because that's what this is. You've got an eye gate and an ear gate and you got a who you hang around gate, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, you got to realize this is a gate. So there's a reason why I can't listen to the music I'm listening to. There's a reason why I can't listen to music that's, you know, just full of cuss words. It's talking about, you know, I'm going to do to this girl and this girl and this guy. And, and I can't listen to even some of the stuff that you would say, oh, it's not so bad. It's just a love song. Do you really need to listen to that right now? Does it glorify God? Is it helping you to think spiritual thoughts or is it helping you to think fleshly thoughts? So you've got to be very careful what you listen to. These are ways because when you start listening to the wrong things, you watch the wrong things. Uh, and, and even hang around the wrong people, you are giving Satan opportunity. He's able to plant more and more and more and more thoughts in your mind and get more and more and more into uh, those type of things, things that are not of God in your heart, which is why the next thing is important. Watch the company you keep. Because the Bible says in Proverbs 13, he that runneth with fools will be destroyed. It didn't say you are a fool, it just said you hang around fools and you'll be destroyed with them. It talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that uh, that who you hang with corrupts your character. In fact, even in 1 Corinthians 5, he tells believers to not hang around other believers who are actively living in sin. Why? Because sin is contagious. This is why people argue against, well, you know, what happens in my bedroom doesn't impact anybody else. I so wish that were true. It's just not true. We know that because we found ourselves doing things we never would have done but what opened the door to us even considering it, not to mention doing it, is that somebody that we hung with did it. I had a conversation recently, somebody, hey, I want to get a tattoo or other things. And the reason why is because somebody else they close to wants to get a tattoo. And not to say their tattoos are bad, but you get it. That's how it works. Who you hang around has a bigger impact on you than you think they do. When it's all said and done, the heart is easily influenced by what we see, what we hear, who we hang around. Partly because when we're doing those things, we're allowing Satan to plant thoughts into our minds. The next thing is that you need to read your Bible and pray every day. I remember growing up in children's church and my dad's church, Word of Faith, we had a song, read your Bible and pray every day and you will grow, grow, grow. You really need to do that. Why? Why every day? Because the Word of God, when you meditate on it, you think about it. That's what meditating is, right? Thinking about God's Word, then God's Word will be rooted in your heart. And you'll find that instead of doing the wrong thing, you'll do the right thing. So you want to make sure that you're reading your Bible every day because God's Word staying rooted in your heart doesn't happen automatically because you heard a message. What actually happens is as soon as this message is over, Satan is coming trying to uproot it. He's, he's hitting you with different things to try to get you to the place where you're offended at God, get you to the place where you forget what you hurt or to get you to get into sin. So what you have to do is you got to on purpose make sure you're constantly pushing God's word into your heart and putting more in so that you are really living the way God wants you to live. But reading the Bible is not good enough. You need to pray every day. And what did Jesus tell Peter and those in the Garden of Gethsemane? Of course, he knew he was about to be tempted. He was about to be crucified. 
and he knew they were going to be tempted. He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. If you spend enough time in prayer, you'll find you're so strong that even when something normally would have tempted you, it just doesn't. Peter didn't pray. So when the temptation came, he fell into sin. Jesus did pray. And so because he did, he was able to allow men to beat him and put nails in his hands and his feet to hang him on a cross for six hours. And he never, ever sinned in the middle of it. It's amazing what happens when you spend time with God every day. It's amazing what happens when you have a strength exchange with God. And that's something you need to gonna have, you're gonna need to have in your life on a daily basis to win from within. Number six, abstain from all appearance of evil. If you stay away from what looks like it could be evil, guess what? You can't do evil. And that's something the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And that kind of goes right into some of the things we just said earlier. Even what you're watching, what you're listening to, and who you're hanging around, and positions you put yourself in. Because when you do that, you're, you're allowing Satan to plant thoughts. You're allowing your heart to be changed. You're putting yourself in a position where you can lose from the inside out. And then lastly, and this is so important, be accountable to others. The Bible says in Hebrews 10 that we're to provoke one another to love and to good works. We're to help each other do the right thing. It says that iron sharpens iron in Proverbs. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. That implies to me that you'll never really be sharp spiritually. You'll never really experience the future God has for you. If you don't have real authentic relationships with other people that are following God, just like you are, that are actually interested in helping you to be who God wants you to be, that someone that, that will check you when you need to be checked, check your thoughts, check your actions. Somebody that, that doesn't have a problem having a little friction with you. Iron sharpens iron, right? Somebody that you open up to enough to allow them to be your friend, to allow them to sharpen you. And when you have those type of relationships, well, those people can help you to win from within. It's why I talk often about groups and why it's so important for us to do life together, not just on a Sunday morning, but in our small groups, whether it's in person or on Zoom or FaceTime or anything along those lines, because you need those relationships. I didn't say it's nice to have them. You need them. If all you do is go to church, but you don't have a small group, you don't have these type of relationships, you will not experience the fullness of what God has for you. That's why God put it in the Bible. That's why the early church met in the temple and from house to house. So you need to be accountable to others. Well, you just heard the dog bark, so I might as well give a great example of why not to give a devil's place. And there he goes again. So this is what we did with him yesterday. Uh, my daughter and I, we were hanging out down here and he's walking around the house and we noticed it got quiet. If you had ever had a one or two year old, you know what that means, right? So... So we, we go upstairs and he's in one of my other daughter's rooms. He's found a foam roller and he's ripped it apart. And so now, you know, of course, he's in trouble and we're, I'm taking him downstairs and I'm putting him in timeout, right? I guess to put the dog in timeout. I wouldn't do it with my kids. And you know what? That's what happens when we give the devil opportunity. When we decide I'm going to watch the wrong stuff, I'm going to listen to the wrong stuff, I'm going to hang around the wrong people, I'm going to think the wrong things. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to, I'm going to do what maybe looks evil because I know I'm not doing evil. I'm a, not, I don't really need any relationships with, with other Christians. I don't really need that. I'm good on my own. You're giving him opportunity. Don't be surprised. He slips up into your life and rips up the foam. <laughs> he rips things up. No, do what the Bible says in first Peter chapter one, gird up the loins of your mind. Make sure you're mentally disciplined do what it takes to do that by watching what you watch, watching what you listen to, watching who you're hanging around, abstaining from the appearance of evil, reading your Bible and praying so the right thoughts are being planted in you and being accountable to others. You can't just play defense. You got to play offense by putting the right things in you as well. I want to end Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's the bottom line. If you're going to win the war with them, you can't be overcome by evil. You can't let your flesh win. You got to overcome evil by, with good. You got to make sure that 
your spirit is winning by putting God's word in it, by surrounding yourself with the right people, putting yourself in the right environment and making sure you're thinking the right things. So I want to challenge you today from now on, do what it takes to win from within. Thank you.